Hello, everyone. And today we will be talking about how to develop Project Eve. You know, this is much less about using it and sort of putting it into a configuration that, you know, can uh, achieve some particular use case and just about the structure of the project, governance of the project and, you know, things like that. So feel free to interrupt anytime. Um, I mean, you can just basically say something or, uh, you know, maybe raise your hand and Vijay will interrupt me. <laughs> um, so with that, let me just deep dive. Uh, I will be talking a little bit before I start, you know, showing you things in, in my uh, terminal window. Uh, so just a few slides before I do that. Um, so what is Project Eve, right? You know, let's first of all, just get the governance process out of the way. Uh, because, you know, developers don't like to focus on it, and yet it is important, you know, for especially when the project gets popular, like, you know, Kubernetes. Uh, so how is Project Eve governed? Well, Project Eve happens to be part of the Linux Foundation uh, LF Edge initiative, right? This is an industry consortia, and uh, the specifically Project Eve uh, has a charter uh, within that consortium. So if you are interested in what the charter is, you know, it's very legalistic language, but you know, sometimes it's still interesting. You can actually hit this uh, wiki page and it has all the links you would, you would need. But suffice it to say that uh, we're a bona fide member of the LF Edge in the sense that we as a project answer to the LF Edge board of directors. Uh, and any kind of, you know, escalation, be it governance related or trademark related or, you know, security related, uh, obviously starts with the project itself, but the good news uh, in our case is that there's actually a higher authority that you can appeal to if uh, something is not quite to your satisfaction within the project itself. And the reason I'm highlighting it is because a lot of times people look at just random projects on GitHub and they take, you know, those random projects and make them, you know, the basis of their IT infrastructure only to realize that they basically have no recourse uh, if that project goes off and does something that they don't like, right? In, in our case, the governance process is pretty formalized. Now, at the project level itself, um, we basically govern ourselves uh, by what's known as the Apache way, uh, which is, you know, not a coincidence. I actually happen to be on the board of directors of the Apache Software Foundation. So <laughs> uh, it's like they say, right? You know, once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I really like how Apache projects govern themselves. And you know, a lot of the same principles apply at Eve level. Uh, all of that is actually documented in this file, you know, uh, that you can click on a link and you know, take a look at what we sort of expect our contributors to be doing and how we expect them to behave. Uh, now, again, all of the sort of decisions, right, you know, community or project related are actually done by the technical steering committee. Uh, and if you're familiar with the Apache projects, you know, in Apache land, that would have been called the PMC, Project Management Committee, but Linux Foundation has a terminology that is slightly different, but conceptual, it's exactly the same. Uh, so there's a technical steering committee that does day-to-day -day governance. Uh, and you can, again, if you click on this contributing.md, you will see a complete list of members of the technical steering committee. Uh, code gets merged by the maintainers. You know, I will talk a little bit about how we develop and how the code flows into the project, but you know, the merges, the actual act of adding code to the code base is done by the main maintainers. And that's pretty much how the project is developed. So any questions on the governance, you know, any questions on sort of what to expect uh, on that side? Okay, moving on then. Uh, so now to the interesting part, right? Uh, where are the bits? Uh, well, you know, pretty much all of the development and collaboration is done on GitHub under the Linux Foundation Edge organization. So again, as you know, GitHub has this idea of organization. So pretty much everything that we have is actually everything that we have is under github.com slash LF Edge. And three projects in particular should be of interest to you. Uh, the first one is Project Eve itself. This is what we're going to spend basically all of the time discussing today. Uh, and uh, it can be, you know, pretty much um, to, to your expectations found under github.com slash LF Edge slash Eve. Uh, there are two other projects that will come into the limelight, you know, at some point. Uh, I don't know how much of it we will be able to cover today, but one is Adam. Uh, which is a reference implementation of an Eve controller. 
Uh, and again, for those of you who remember previous presentation, uh, you should remember that Eve uh, is always being uh, sort of managed by its controller. You know, by itself, Eve doesn't really do anything. So Adam is a reference implementation of that controller. Uh, and obviously the commercial implementation would be something like, you know, ZD the cloud or, you know, uh, hopefully some other controllers that may uh, start popping up uh, someday. Now, again, what's interesting is uh, the API between the Eve and the controller is all open source. And that's why it's important for us to have a reference implementation. You know, obviously Eve has a part of it and then the Atom has the other part of it. Uh, Atom is also being used for testing quite extensively. And speaking of testing uh, and developer tooling, this is the third project that may be of interest to you called Eden. Uh, and that is available in LF Edge slash Eden. So again, no surprise there. So that's sort of the source code, right? Uh, now that source code obviously gets uh, converted into useful binary artifacts. Uh, we're exclusively using Docker Hub uh, under the LF Edge again organization uh, to basically manage all, all of our binary artifacts. Now, when I say all of our binary artifacts, I really do mean all of it, right? And if a more sort of uh, classical Linux distribution would use something like, you know, Debian packages or RPM packages, uh, we're effectively utilizing Docker Hub as a store for uh, Docker container images. But again, our view of the Docker container images is mostly along the lines of glorified tarballs, right? Which is basically using it to store bits. Uh, and there are two reasons for that, right? You know, first of all, Docker Hub is very well integrated into a development workflow that is, you know, familiar to anyone who is developing software today. And second of all, Docker Hub actually has a very gener generous program for, you know, how much stuff you can store there. I mean, it used to be like super gen generous. Now it's a little bit less generous, I guess, you know, for the general public, but Linux Foundation still has that relationship. So we can pretty much use it as an unlimited storage. Well, I mean, within reason and uh, anything and everything that our CI CD pipelines do end up on Docker Hub. So source code, binary artifacts, and finally the collaboration itself. So again, if you want the top level sort of entry point to anything that has to do with collaboration, uh, just head over to uh, projecteve.dev. I mean, just like one of those cool projects we actually have .dev, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, top level domain. Um, and you will see links to mailing lists, you know, Slack channels uh, and LF Edge Wiki and a couple of other resources uh, on that website. Now, speaking of LF Edge Wiki, uh, that's actually a very useful uh, resource for collaboration. So let's actually deep dive a little bit into the development process. And, uh, you know, if you click on that link, uh, you will basically get to the Wiki page. And there's a couple of interesting things that you will see there, right? So uh, first of all, you will see uh, this section that I linked here in the first bullet, uh, uh, which is essentially a place where we put all of our non-trivial architecture proposals. So let me just give you an example uh, of one of those. Um, so if I go to, to the wiki, right, as I promised, I mean, it's, it's a wiki like any other. I mean, I'm sure you have seen a wiki before, uh, but if you click here, you know, feature design proposals, you will basically see a few right here. And, you know, let's see this one that I've been working on, right, you know, uh, recently. So the, here's the date when it got proposed, you know, it was approved and it was approved by consensus, you know, on this date. So you, if you're interested in the discussion or whatever, you can go to the mailing list and check it out. Uh, the proposal itself is pretty free form. So it typically starts with the background and motivation. In this particular case, it talks about storage and you know storage performance and a few other things, right? Uh, and then you know it's typically a freeform proposal, uh, you know, explaining the technical idea, uh, you know, development steps, you know, kind of outlining what's required, and typically a discussion section allowing all of the contributors and participants to basically leave their feedback. And pretty much everything that we've done that is non-trivial would have a proposal here associated with it, uh, which gives you a little bit more of a, you know, good feeling for how the project manages non-trivial changes. Because, you know, bug fixes and simple things can be managed by just sending a pull request. But if it's something less trivial, I mean, we typically require that you put a proposal out. Um, 
So another interesting uh, part of the LF Edge Wiki is this EVE hardware compatibility list. So again, let me click on the link here. Um, even the market. Uh, and this is basically all of the uh, different types of hardware configuration, you know, sometimes boards like, you know, Jetson Nano or Raspberry Pi, you know, that somebody someplace tried EVE on and it was satisfactory. And we're sort of recording that as much as we can. Now, this list doesn't mean that uh, there is any kind of commercial entity that is supporting all of that. Although a lot of times it is a good first step, uh, you know, to determine what can be easily supported, right? So if something is on this list, you know, pretty much it means that, you know, you can kind of reach out to any commercial entity that may be, you know, interested in supporting EVE. And today in the uh, LF Edge, you know, we actually have, uh, obviously there is Zedida. I mean, uh, the company sort of that you can buy commercial uh, support uh, for EVE. But there are also hardware vendors like, you know, Supermicro, Adventech, a few others, you know, that may be uh, willing to uh, work with you on parts of the hardware support. And, you know, obviously there are a few system integration companies that are showing, you know, signs of interest in essentially supporting, um, you know, various bits and pieces. Um, but the key to understand is, you know, a lot of times it's just easier to go to this page and check out, you know, what's already kind of supported, at least in the community. Right uh, before you deep dive into a conversation with a system integration company or somebody else. Um, so then there is a mailing list. Again, I you know not not really much to talk about it. Slack channels are pretty active, so I highly recommend if you are serious and sort of you know your day to day maybe or at least week to week um, uh, you know life involves Eve. You know it's pretty useful to be on Slack. You know I'm pretty active on Slack. I mean there's a pretty good community there. And of course, you know, pretty much everything else is done through the GitHub pull requests. Uh, we are really the type of a community that likes code uh, much more than, you know, any other form of uh, discussion, right? Uh, and again, when I say code, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a computer program, right? You know, code can be a code for like an MD file, you know, for your documentation or, you know, something like that, right? What I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, instead of a lengthy kind of like architectural, you know, discussion on a mailing list, we typically prefer that, you know, there's either a proposal, you know, that is put on the wiki or just a pull request that is sent to us, because it's much easier to discuss it on the pull request itself, you know, when you actually have something to look at, as opposed to, you know, having, you know, sometimes an academic discussion uh, on a mailing list. So that's just the preference I have. Uh, so any questions on the development process so far? Okie doke, moving on. <laughs> so, so then, you know, I kind of described when it begins, right? And it begins with the source code and typically begins with the pull request being contributed. Uh, and I described where it ends. It ends on Docker Hub. So what's in the middle? Well, in the middle, we have our CI CD pipeline. And our CI CD pipeline is almost exclusively done through GitHub Actions. And if you guys have not used or seen or done GitHub Actions, I highly recommend it because it basically is probably the closest a developer today can get to serverless and kind of like, you know, Lambda programming in a day to day life. But it's basically small pieces of code that can be launched based on the events that the GitHub itself generates like a pull request being sent or, uh, you know, maybe something getting merged or, you know, an issue being created. So GitHub as any website, you know, like that has an eventing system and that eventing system nowadays can launch an event, which is basically creating a virtual machine on uh, Azure cloud. All of that is being done transparently and essentially launching a piece of code that you specified for that event. So if you go again, if you go to our website, um, let me just get this out of the way. If you go to our website uh, and you go to the actions, you know, part of the uh, GitHub, you will see that we have, you know, quite an extensive collection of actions. Uh, a lot of these actions are basically checks uh, that a pull request would have, right? So uh, let's take this pull request that I sent, you know, yesterday. So obviously this pull request has, you know, a description which, you know, is not really formal. But, you know, we require that at least you tell us, you know, what it is all about, right? It has, a, you know, changes, but it also has this section of uh, checks. And all of these checks are effectively done at, as GitHub actions. 
Uh, now, again, if you're curious, uh, kind of like what these checks are, you know, are or how they are implemented, all of it, and I will, you know, talk a bit, a bit about it, you know, uh, later on, but all of it is under .github workflows, right? So all of the code for these, you know, actions are essentially specified in YAML files. Uh, so you can kind of take a look and there's actually a good collection of, you know, examples. So even if you're just interested in what, what the heck is a GitHub action, this is a good place to start. Um, now, finally, uh, for CI CD pipeline, you know, obviously there's amount, you know, some amount of testing. So we do invest in unit tests and unit tests is just what it, what, you know, what it sounds like. It's a test that runs, you know, and tests a unit of code. Uh, but then we also do system level testing. And for that, we have sort of different levels of infrastructure that we utilize to make sure that, you know, we don't break anything in ETH, right? So uh, like I told you, I mean, uh, GitHub is actually pretty generous in uh, the size of the VM that it actually gives you by default for free. I mean, it doesn't even charge you. Uh, so we use that same VM to run, uh, you know, an amount of tests. Uh, and that's actually where the Eden kicks in, right? So within the GitHub action that actually builds something, you know, there is a subset of it that runs tests and those are Eden tests. Uh, then we actually utilize Google Compute Platform VMs uh, because Google Compute happens to be one of the few clouds that actually support nested virtualization. And, you know, since you guys are aware that Eve is, you know, very significantly based on the virtualization, you know, we need access to uh, hardware assisted virtualization and Google gives us that, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then on top of that, we actually run on bare metal. So two places where we do that is, uh, Packet.net, nowadays known as Equinix Metal, uh, have donated 22 different hardware configurations, you know, to us to basically run uh, EVE on. And some of these configurations are pretty sort of run of the mill of what you would find in any data center, like Dell, HP, Supermicro, you know, those types of things. But some of them are actually pretty interesting, right? So we, for example, you know, run on uh, Huawei ARM servers, right? And Hello. Foxconn, Foxconn ARM servers. Somebody was asking something? Any questions? I think we're just someone on mute, uh, who will mute. Oh, here. okay. So, okay, could be. Yes. Um, and finally, obviously, we have you know uh, uh, the hardware lab that is on the ZDDA side, uh, and that lab is mostly used for the types of configurations that are not available anywhere else. Uh, or maybe available, but, you know, difficult to manage. So for example, you know, in, in the lab that we manage, you know, we have Raspberry Pis and Jetson Nanos, uh, but we obviously also have, uh, you know, all of the instances of the hardware that our customers are using, right? So we don't have to depend on somebody else managing that hardware for us. You know, all of that is on the ZD side. So the test infrastructure is pretty uh, heterogeneous. Uh, but, you know, given that Eve at the end of the day is practically an operating system, you know, in and of itself, I mean, that's what you have to have when you uh, develop an operating system. So that's our CI CD pipeline. Um, so before I actually jump to my terminal, let me just kind of quickly summarize, you know, all of the uh, bits and pieces that we take from the upstream, right, and we depend on. Uh, so pretty much everything that is a bespoke Linux distribution, like, you know, if you need a shell, right, or if you need like an, an init system, or if you need like an LS command or whatever, right, you know, just kind of like, you know, bits that we don't even think about most of the time, uh, we just kind of use them and we expect them to be there. You know, those bits come to us from Alpine Linux. So we don't actually rebuild those, right? You know, and all of the uh, development bits, GCC, you know, G++, you know, all of that stuff that also comes to us from Alpine Linux. And uh, currently we're using Alpine 3.13.2. Uh, Alpine is actually great for two reasons. You know, first of all, it's one of the quickest distributions to react to CVEs and exploits. So they actually patch, you know, very, very quickly. And second of all, uh, Alpine uh, was designed from the ground up uh, to be uh, addressing a use case of what was, you know, still like what used to be known and still known as cloud native development, right? As opposed to traditional Linux distribution. Because, you know, the problem with some of the other Linux distros, which, 
you know, maybe more popular than Alpine, like, you know, let's say Red Hat or CentOS or, you know, Ubuntu Canonical, you know, all of those guys, is that they're pretty old school in the sense that they're trying to do everything, you know, pretty much in a single package, right? You know, they're trying to do servers, desktops, IoT, Edge, you know, just about anything. Uh, and it's like, it's difficult to be, you know, all things to all people, right? You know, it just, you end up spending way more time and, you know, you end up being more bloated. Uh, Alpine is just focused on, you know, very small, tiny Linux, you know, use case, which is, you know, running in a cloud or running in, you know, constrained environments. And that's why we like it. Uh, now, second major component that we use exclusively uh, for sort of building the distribution itself is Linux Kit. And for those of you not familiar with Linux Kit, you know, this is what uh, Docker people have developed to basically produce their flagship product, you know, Docker desktop. Uh, so if you're using Docker on your laptop or desktop today, you're effectively using something that was built using Linux Kit. Uh, so uh, in a way, I mean, it's, it's this weird thing, right? You know, where in a way, Docker produced the one of the most you know, widely used Linux distributions out there. It's just, they didn't have to call it a Linux distribution because, you know, the point for them was to produce this other product, which was, you know, Docker Desktop, but it is actually one of the, one of the uh, uh, most popular Linux distributions today. So we are reusing all of that. Now then, you know, the major upstream dependencies that we have to pay attention to, and we sort of do a great deal of, uh, you know, we spend a great deal of effort curating those components, are Linux itself, you know, Linux kernel, uh, Zen, because we still support, you know, Zen and KVM, and QAML. So these three are uh, very fundamental to us. And, you know, uh, if you ever wonder, you know, about support, you know, this is, this is actually where our support kicks in. And obviously it extends to the bits that we created ourselves. Uh, any questions about, you know, uh, upstream dependencies? <clears throat> Okie doke, moving on. So then, you know, the final slide that I have, I think, uh, I think that the, that's the final one is the project structure. So uh, it's basically like it's a pretty simple project, you know, in a way. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of folders uh, that you will see, and then we'll switch to the um, to the browser window to kind of walk you through, you know, some of it. Uh, so uh, the most interesting one, uh, which is not really something that you would be working, you know, day in and day out, is this API folder. So it is an Eve to the controller API specification, which is done on the protobuf. Uh, and, you know, it also contains implementations, which is basically automatically generated files, you know, for Go, Python, and, you know, everything else. Uh, it also contains documentation and specification, you know, in sort of human readable language, you know, for the API. So again, if you're curious about, you know, Eve and how Eve API is different from, let's say, Kubernetes, you know, Kubelet API or something like that, this is a good place to dive in and take a look and sort of see, it's a pretty simple API, right? You know, it's structured in a very simple way, uh, but it gives you a full sort of appreciation for what are the bits and pieces that Eve has to, uh, has to care about. Uh, and then the rest is, you know, just project itself, right? Uh, so there are build tools, you know, that's the Linux kit, you know, I told you about. So again, uh, by default, you know, we don't actually have Linux kit embedded in our project, but when you do your first build, there will be artifacts, which is, you know, one of them like literally will be called Linux kit. It's an executable that you can run on your machine uh, that will be created under the build tools. Uh, docs uh, are, you know, pretty extensive documentation for the project. So again, highly recommend you go through it. Uh, images are basically image specifications for the uh, Linux kit, how to put the distribution together. And I will, you know, don't worry, I will spend more time, you know, showing you what's what. Uh, configuration is the initial configuration for Eve, you know, that you can bake into an image. Uh, and packages are basically where everything else, you know, in the project, all the code and, you know, all of the artifacts uh, exist. Uh, the two other folders are, you know, there's the boards for like, you know, ARM, mostly for ARM stuff, BSP bits, and, you know, dot folders, mostly for CI/CD system. So with that in mind, let's actually go and walk through the, um, walk through the GitHub repo uh, a little bit, right? So like I told you, let's actually get the conf out of the way. Uh, so conf is the folder that has, you know, things like uh, initial certificates, you know, for onboarding, you know, initial configuration, let's say for Grub, uh, and all of it is tweakable. 
typically on a live system, you don't really have to tweak it. Uh, but when you're building something, you know, as a developer, I actually tweak it here all the time, right? Because, you know, I can put different things and, you know, like server, for example, allows me to connect to uh, a controller. So obviously, you know, by default is, you know, this Z cloud controller from Zvida. Uh, but if I'm developing locally, I might be able to connect it to the local uh, version of uh, Adam. That is again, a reference implementation of a controller that anybody can run. So I will change it to something that is, you know, uh, a URL or an IP address of my, you know, local machine. Um, so that's conf. Uh, the other ones that I wanted to show you are images. So images are kind of interesting. I mean, the rootfs image is probably the entry point for everything else. Uh, and if you look at the rootfs, this is basically the top level entry point for the Linux kit build system. So effectively what it tells Linux kit is to compose a read-only uh, you know, bootable image uh, with the following bits and pieces. And it's just like a full specification of what needs to go into that image. So it basically tells you know, what, uh, what kind of a Linux kernel it needs to take. You know, it tells uh, Linux kit you know, what needs to be put into just files in the root file system. Uh, then it has you know, this idea of containers and think of containers as you know, services, right? you know, something like you would do in any D system or system D, right? But these services are just Docker containers, right? You know, you kind of like just run it once, you know, in this section. And these are the services that I expected to run forever on the system. And that's pretty much it, right? Uh, so for example, right, you know, just to give you an example, uh, if you are curious about, you know, what is this uh, Linux kit open NTPD? Well, that's just a Docker container, right? So you can basically do Docker pool, you know, like this, right? And uh, you can actually run it and you can inspect uh, what's inside Docker run. Let's actually specify entry point of our own. So let's make it shell. Um, and Right, so here you can actually inspect it. You know, you can see uh, what bits are here. Right, you know, you can test it, and this is this is what I mean when I say that uh, Eve is basically developed very differently from a traditional Linux distribution because we rely a great deal on containers being a unified executable format, uh, much more than you know even cloud native people do. Right, because the entire Eve is composed of these containers. And the reason we like containers is because it is a unit of development. It is a unit of testing. I can take this container and run it separately. I can run you know, unit tests against it. It's actually very, very useful. And this container is truly self-contained, right? You know, I don't actually need to have anything else you know, but this container to run a lot of tests on it. Uh, and so that's one type of the container. There's actually a different type of a container. Um, and let me show you that. So let's take, for example, uh, let's actually take, you know, this kernel thing. So, uh, just one bit. okay. So like I promised you, you know, there's build tools and typically you would use Linux kit to do low level, um, you know, kind of poking at containers. So one useful command is PKG, right? You know, if you run it like that, it will tell you, you know, what's capable of. And, you know, the thing is show tag, which will show you the uh, version of a particular container that I actually have here, you know, under PKG and we'll get to PKG soon. So let me do this. So if I do this, it will tell me, uh, you know, what is the version of that container, kind of like a full URL that I can use with Docker. Right, and this one is not an executable container. This is like I explained to you a second type of a container, you know, container image that we're simply using to store the bits. So let's actually take a look inside of what bits do we, uh, do we use out of this container. So because I cannot run it, I mean, all I can do is do Docker create, which will lay out the bits in my file system, right? You know, and it will take a little bit of time to pull it from Docker Hub, but that's fine. Uh, and then I will show you what's inside. So let's, let's actually, uh, my internet is slow today, so let's actually uh, let it be for a little while. Uh, but any questions so far about, you know, what I'm kind of going through, what I'm explaining? Uh, 
Okay, Doc. So yes. So are most of your containers do they require root privileges? Uh, that's actually well. How should I explain it? Uh, no and yes, in a sense that uh, the way that they executed on Eve is completely different from how you would execute them on your desktop, right? Okay. On your, so on according to your thread analysis, it's not a problem. You know what they have access to. Uh, correct, because Eve uses a different style of container isolation than you know you would typically find with you know mm -hmm. Kubernetes or mm -hmm. you know Docker or whatever. So like within Eve itself, uh, it is not a problem. But when you're running it in uh, you know let's say doing unit tests, you know on your desktop, uh, some containers would have to be run as privileged. Uh, there's actually not a lot of them, but some do. Okay, so now we basically have the bits laid out in the file system, and you know we can actually take a look at the bits. So you know, let's run Docker export uh, and just pipe it into tar, so that tar can um, show us what's inside. So as you can see, this container image is nothing but a glorified tarball. So effectively, it has a kernel, right? You know, which is a Linux kernel that will get extracted. So this is the command that will extract it eventually, right? And put it into an executable image. It also has things like, you know, kernel header files, you know, for development. It has, the, you know, all of the, uh, all of the modules uh, that will also be extracted in the root file system, stuff like that. So this is the second style of the container, which I cannot execute. So like I cannot do Docker run, you know, uh, there's nothing to run. We just use it for bits, right? Uh, a good rule of thumb is that anything that's in the on boot section or services section is runnable. And we actually exploit that ability to run that container a lot. Again, like I said, for unit tests and you know whatnot. Anything that's in the kernel or init section is not runnable. Although there are exceptions because, like, you know, let's say uh, Mamlockd, for example, this guy is runnable and Getty is runnable and you know things like that, right? Uh, but this basically gives you an entire uh, specification for what will get inside of your root image, right? Uh, so what is a root image? Well, root image actually in our case, most of the time happens to be SquashFS file system. And uh, once I do a build, and again, I'm jumping ahead a, a little bit of myself, but you know, uh, I'll just show you what's inside of the root image, just so that you can appreciate, you know, what is it that we're actually trying to build. So, uh, you know, I can just use unsquashfs uh, and, you know, uh, everything, all of the build artifacts locally are under dist and architecture name, AMD64, and then the version of the artifact that I'm building. So in this particular case, this, or I can also use a symlink that is being created, you know, which is the current build. You know, this is basically the latest build that I've done. Under here, you know, actually you will have another folder called installer. And here you will have a rootfs IMG, which is the output of running Linux kit effectively on this YAML file uh, and, you know, supplying it with all of the required containers. So let's take a look, right? I mean, you will see that it's a pretty standard Linux distribution type of a layout, right? You know, obviously you have your, you know, bin and user and, you know, stuff like that, right? Uh, but the bits that are mostly interesting are the bits under the containers. Right, this is how Linux Kit packages all of these containers in services and on boot section. So for example, you have the storage init, right? You know, which corresponds to this guy, right? And you know, same way you would have new logd and you know stuff like that. Uh, so one last bit here is that I wanted to point out that you know we pride ourselves on uh rootfs being super small. Uh you know, 200 and uh, 20 megabytes is not large, even by the embedded standards. Uh, and you might ask, like, how can you guys have your cake and eat it too? Because like, like I told you, right, you know, all of these containers are self effectively self-contained. So, you know, all of them will have like Alpine bits and pieces, right? You know, some of the auxiliary bits and pieces. And the answer to that is, you know, twofold. Well, first of all, Alpine is super efficient. So, you know, thanks to how Alpine is put together, we don't actually have to get, you know, and take the bloat of glibc or libc, you know, from GNU project, you know, it's using busybox, you know, and, you know, it's super efficient in how it uses resources. So that's one, you know, side of the answer. The other side of the answer is that because we're building a SquashFS image, you know, SquashFS effectively does dedupe, 
And you know, all of the bits and pieces that are actually common between these containers will get deduped and only you know get represented once in the uh, in the image. So you know that's what allows us to keep the size you know really small, and that's you know one of the points of pride, <laughs> so to speak, for us. Uh, but ultimately, you know, in the build, what you're trying to build is this artifact, right? You know, your build is there to produce rootfs. Uh, and there's a few additional ones, but rootfs is sort of the star of the show. That is what, you know, what gets output at the end of the build. Uh, any questions about that? Okay, so let me then, you know, deep dive a little bit into the build system itself. So if you run make, you know, our build system is not really super, you know, make dependent. I mean, we're kind of using make as just a way to run scripts. Right, but if you just run make, it will actually produce a pretty, you know, uh, well-documented, you know, set of targets that you can use, right? And there are basically, uh, you know, kind of like three sets of targets, right? You know, if you're a maintainer or a developer, you might be interested in these ones. Uh, so there's like a test, you know, for running unit tests, you know, there is a, a, a you know, proto for managing the API, you know, folder, uh, but typically you don't actually use them, right? Because just to give you an example, because I'm a maintainer and I do releases all the time, you know, think of me as a build master, you know, when I do that, uh, I would use this release target. But if you don't do releases, I mean, you wouldn't use it. I mean, that sort of thing. Now, second set of targets is actually pretty commonly used by everybody, right? And these are the targets that produce useful build artifacts. Uh, like I said, I mean, rootfs is the start of the show. So, you know, you typically would do make, you know, rootfs to build that rootfs image that I was showing you. There's actually, and it's also documented here, uh, there's a... Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, there's also installer images of Eve, right? Uh, and uh, we will get to that you know, a little bit later. So uh, with rootfs, um, I will not run the build right now. I mean, I could, that's, that's all it takes, but it just takes, you know, a minute or two. So uh, I'll just keep going and show you the other useful, uh, you know, the second most useful sort of build target. Uh, and that would be pkg slash something, right? Uh, now that is building of all of the packages that we're managing ourselves. And before I show you that target, let me actually show you the packages themselves. Now, packages live under the PKG folder, right? And these are the packages, again, that you could either see in the rootfs YAML, right? You know, so for example, new log D and TPD, WN, you know, all of these packages, right? Uh, so pretty much all of them are here, you know, within the few exceptions that we take upstream from Linux Kit itself. So if you're interested in figuring out, you know, how one of those packages is put together, you know, you can click on a folder here, right? You know, let's pick one, uh, let's pick, let's say, uh, grub, right? You know, so if you want to know how we build our grub, you need to click on this Docker file and the Docker file is effectively what drives the build of this particular package, right? You know, just again, like anybody doing cloud native development would do. Now, most of the time, the Docker file is simply an entry point to call something from the make file, right? So in this particular case, you know, obviously we're calling, you know, autogen configure, just kind of like the usual stuff, right? Uh, and then we install it someplace and then the package gets produced. Now, the way to automate it, you know, again, actually let me ls, you know, pkg, right? You know, all of these packages, you can actually build individual ones by simply typing make pkg, let's say grub, right? And that will start building your grub. Pretty simple. So uh, this is effectively nothing but a Docker build in disguise, right? Uh, so I could have as easily, let me control C it, I could have as easily do PK, CD, PKG, grub, um, you know, there's a Docker file, so I can just do Docker build dot, right? You know, that would have worked. But the problem is it would not have provided the tags that Linux kit would expect. Uh, so you can do this while developing and, you know, maybe you're tweaking, you know, the content of the Docker file and, you know, you just keep doing Docker build dot. Uh, that's fine, you can do that. But if you want to build an image that can then be picked up by Linux kit, you actually have to do it from the top level like I showed you, you know, through uh, make pkg slash something, right? You know, that's how you can you can make all of the packages. So like I said, I mean, this is the second most useful build target. 
Now there's kind of like a top level build target for all of the package, uh, packages called PKGF. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because our make file, like I said, I mean, it's not really a true make file. It's more just a way, you know, convenient way to run scripts. Uh, so we don't actually track whether you have provided all of the packages, you know, for building a rootfs. So if your make rootfs fails, a lot of times that is because you made some local changes to your packages, but you haven't really, you forgot to run, you know, make pkg slash something. And if you don't want to figure out what it is, you can just run make pkgs, you know, plural, and that will build all of the packages locally. And, you know, after that, your rootfs make rootfs is guaranteed to succeed. Uh, there's a few other uh, interesting build targets. You know, uh, there's a uh, build target that produces installer. There's a build target that produces live image. And finally, there is a build target. Um, there is a build target that produces, uh, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, just different styles of the uh, installer, installer images. Now, running a live target takes a little bit of time. So rootfs typically takes, you know, a minute or two. Live takes, you know, up to three, four minutes, right? So I will not run it right now. I actually have it already done. So just running make live would have sufficed. But after you have make live, right, you know, under this architecture, in our case, AMD64 current, you will basically have a few artifacts. Uh, that are effectively bootable, right? So here I have the live.qcow2 uh, and that live.qcow2 can be booted. And the good news is I can even boot it on my own laptop. This by the way, is all developed on a Mac OS. Uh, I actually have, you know, I have recently bought myself a Windows laptop so I can develop natively on Windows as well. And again, this is a nice departure from how a typical Linux distribution would be developed. And especially in the embedded space, you know, where you would have to have a Linux desktop or a VM or something, and it's kind of like pretty inconvenient. Here, the only true dependency that we have is on the Docker client. So as long as I have a Docker client, right, as long as I can run, you know, Docker version, right, and that is successful, uh, that is all. That is all that is required, right? You know, you don't have to have like tool chains and you know pre-installed GCC or something, right? It's all managed as containers, and the only thing that you have to have is the Docker. Uh, so, but, you know, sometimes you actually have to run the stuff that you've built, right? You poke at it or whatnot. And for that, there is a useful target called make run, right? And the only other bit that you should know is that there is this acceleration, which is, you know, you can specify. And that acceleration sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Uh, that is why it's turned off by default. Uh, without the acceleration, you know, E will still run. It just will be slower. Um, but with acceleration, which I configured on my laptop, uh, that will be faster. So if I hit this, right, uh, you know, the build system will check for a few things, but finally it will launch a QEMU. And this is basically how a boot of Eve would look on a real piece of hardware, right? You know, this is the boot, you know, and you can debug or poke at everything, you know, starting from the grub uh, menu, right? Uh, so let's hit enter, you know, Eve boots, right? You know, that is actually pretty quick, even on my laptop, like I'm saying, I mean, it's actually a pretty old laptop, you know, five years old by now, but voila, we basically have Eve up and running, right? And here I can poke at different things, you know, uh, it'll bootstrap and stop spewing messages on the console. Uh, or if I want it to be uh, sort of not as, you know, crazy on the console, I can use the Eve CLI, you know, in, inside of Eve itself. And there's this Eve uh, verbose uh, off thingy that I can do. Um, so that will make it quiet. But this is basically Eve, right? You know, this is what's inside of Eve looks like. Uh, right, you know, these are the all of the containers, you know, that I was telling you. The Eve CLI will tell you, you know, the status of the system, you know, so Zen tools, for example, stopped, uh, and we can figure out why, and I can tell you exactly why. That is because I don't have nested virtualization on my laptop uh, with QEMU. Uh, but other than that, you can inspect, you know, different packages because, again, everything is running as a container. You can use this cool trick by essentially saying Eve exec, uh, let's say name of the container, like, I don't know, let's take uh, something like uh, pillar, for example, right? You know, this is the top level container that I have. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
I, I have a question. Why did you decide yeah. to run everything as a container? Uh, because it provides uh, it provides us uh, with the um, isolation that is required uh, for the defense in depth. And uh, right now we don't actually use it. I mean, that's on the roadmap, but every single one of these containers will be run with a thin hypervisor around it, which provides a much nicer property for how the system can be defended against. So that if one part of the system gets hacked, you don't get to hack the rest of the system. So again, I mean, there is much more uh, of that available in the cubes uh, of, uh, OS literature, right? But it's basically how you build, you know, systems that are much harder to hack compared to a traditional, especially embedded Linux. Because with an embedded Linux, even if you hack like a, you know, Bluetooth stack of your Linux kernel or something like the whole system goes down. Um, so right now, Eve is basically trying to connect to its controller. So that will you know, keep happening because obviously I just built it. So I haven't had time to configure it on the cloud side. It's trying to contact the ZD the controller. I mean, I could have specified some other controller, but uh, right now it's a ZD the controller. Um, that's pretty much how Eve would feel like, right? Because it's a QEMU, you know, I can, I can terminate it at any time. Now, if I run make, I think it's specified here as well. Let me see. Yeah. So there's basically a run live, right? You know, uh, which is the default QEMU, uh, but there's also run live parallels. So uh, on Mac OS, you know, if you have a parallels uh, desktop, which actually does support nested virtualization, uh, you can run, you know, parallels. There's also virtual box, uh, you know, if you are into that. And I think there was somebody who was working on the VMware, uh, you know, what's it called, Fusion or something, uh, you know, desktop thingy. Uh, but because most of our developers are actually on Mac OS, uh, VMware is not really that sort of nice on Mac OS. I mean, on Mac OS, you would typically use Parallels if you want to pay somebody, or you would use, you know, QM or VirtualBox if you are satisfied with, you know, the state of things in the open source. Uh, there's a few other, you know, useful uh, targets, you know, like there is a run grub that will just run grub, right? So a lot of times, you know, I will just do this, for example. Um, oh, sorry. Run, run grub. Especially when I'm poking at, you know, different types of, uh, you know, boot sequence or, you know, hacking in that space, right? You know, I just need to get as quickly as possible to the grub. I don't even want to build rootfs, you know, so I can just launch grub and QM and, you know, poke at it, right? Um, so that's pretty much all on the, how you would sort of manage it on, you know, like day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and two last bits that I wanted to cover are installers and sort of the overall Uber package that we produce and place on Docker Hub. Uh, but before I go there, any questions about sort of the composition of the system or, you know, how to get going with it? Okay, look. So then, you know, uh, useful targets, you know, I don't actually build it all the time these days, but a useful nonetheless is one of these installer targets. So installer is basically a different style of an Eve image that is only used to install Eve, you know, on a particular piece of hardware, right? So that installer can be done either as a bootable raw disk or as an ISO. I mean, these days we typically just do installers as raw disks, you know, ISOs are useful sometimes on like really weird pieces of, you know, hardware, but that's about it. Now, just like everything else, you know, you would typically run, oh, and let me show you this, right? So HV stands for hypervisor. So if you want to tell by default, by the way, nowadays we're using KVM, but if you want to specify a different hypervisor, you can type HV equals Zen or HV equals Acorn. I actually thought that it was documented here as well, but I guess not. So that would be my um, action item from today's meeting to actually update the make file documentation uh, because this is pretty useful. So, but you know, you can even specify KVM even, even though it's, it's on by default. And then, you know, we can run, let's say uh, installer targets, right? You know, and that will produce an installer. So I will let it run. And while it runs, uh, I will explain a few things uh, about different architectures. So Eve actually supports, you know, two architectures, uh, x86 and uh, Intel. 
uh, and uh, x86 and ARM, sorry. And uh, you can actually do a bit of a cross build, uh, although it is less convenient, I must say, than you know what you would typically have with embedded systems. Uh, that said, now that Docker has made BuildKit a default in pretty much all of the distributions of you know Docker uh, uh, client, we're actually migrating to uh, Docker BuildKit, and that will make cross builds you know pretty much a breed, uh, even even on even the way we're using it. Uh, but basically, you know, we are right now producing an installer, and once it's done, I will I will show you how how you can uh, you can work with it. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to cover is this package that gets uh, deposited on Docker Hub, uh, Hub okay. called Eve, and this is the package that is effectively the output of every release that Eve has, right? Uh, so there's multiple versions of it uh, available. Uh, you know, you can browse through them every time, you know, there's a commit to the master, you know, we build a new package of this sort. Uh, and obviously we do it for the official releases. Uh, so for example, this, this release is, you know, for the um, you know, 6.2.0 uh, for the Raspberry Pi. And the reason I'm showing you this is because it is effectively an executable, right? Like I said, all of the other packages that we do, you know, they're sort of internal and, you know, they're mostly useful for developers. This is the only package that we will actually tell sometimes even our customers to run. So let me show you how it's done. So this is the package that you can get from, you know, LF Edge, Docker Hub, Eve, you know, just like anything else. Let me make my font bigger a little bit here. Ooh. So I can do, let's say, Docker run, LF edge, um, Eve, then the version number, so 6.2.0, let's say KVM, right? And if I do that, you know, that package, you know, will be fetched from Docker Hub, like what's happening right now. Uh, and then once I run it, uh, it will produce the output that would tell me what I can do. Now, again, this is effectively an executable. Right, so think of it as you know one of those really useful Docker packages that you can run on your system, and they actually produce something. So this is what this is meant to be. So it is effectively meant to produce all sorts of artifacts, you know, on the fly. So you don't have to go through lengthy, you know, like it's still running. Actually, I think it's done. Uh, build system, but you can get the very same artifacts, you know, from just running this package. So what are the artifacts, right? So in this case, you know, we built an installer. So let's see under this. AMD64 current, right? So now we have this installer.raw. And if we look at its size, uh, it will be basically about the same as uh, Eve, you know, uh, root FS, but it's bigger because it also carries, you know, some of the additional bits. Now, if I run this uh, on an actual piece of hardware, what this image will do, it will actually install Eve on that piece of hardware. Now, because I have to develop and debug it, you know, I can also run it locally. So let me do make uh, uh, Excel and just see run installers.raw. So this will effectively simulate what it would feel and, you know, look like running an installer on an actual piece of hardware, but it would obviously simulate it here in my uh, QM environment, right? Um, so let's uh, let it boot for a little while. But I can basically get to the same installer artifact here as well. And that's the point. Uh, I can also get to RootFS and a few other things, but uh, once it's done, um, once it's done, I can show you uh, all of it. Uh, any questions so far? So in a way, it's a pretty compact way of managing an entire operating system, right? You know, that's what we like about it. And it's very sort of Docker, you know, developer friendly uh, that way, uh, which again, you know, in, in this day and age is, you know, counts for a lot because, you know, developers have a pretty short attention span. Uh, okay, so this, this is now done extracting. Um, and it basically, you know, if you just run it by default, it produces a help, you know, screen message, whatever you know, want to call it. Uh, right, uh, and then uh, you can run various, you know, uh, options here. So, for example, if I run, let's say, installer underscore raw, and I pipe the output into some file locally, 
it will effectively produce the same installer that you know the build system produced. Uh, but instead of a build system taking you know four minutes, uh, this will take only like you know up up to a minute, basically. So let's let's see. I think I basically need to change my uh, the boot options. Let's see what managing. Oh yeah, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Anyway, so here, I mean, we basically get the same installer.raw, right? Um, and that doesn't require any build system at all. So running this, you know, executable container, which is, you know, can be run again on any system, you know, Windows, you know, Linux, uh, Mac OS, you name it. You basically get to the same set of artifacts that a build system would produce for you. Now, obviously, this is useful for you know an end consumer, an end user, right? Uh, but if you're developing day in and day out, I mean, the other way is more convenient. Uh, the only other bit is that you can actually fetch for different architectures, right? So this obviously was an Intel image. If I want to fetch for ARM, I can just explicitly add ARM64, and I can fetch the same uh, image for ARM64. Uh, the default is just the default for my operating system, right? So, I mean, I could always specify it explicitly. So even here on my laptop, I could have typed AMD 64 and that would produce the same result. But basically if I type ARM 64, it will fetch that. Uh, and uh, here I am actually not sure what's going on, but let me see. Yeah, I was actually mucking about with my, you know, UFI settings here. So I think that's uh, that's why I ended up with the QM hard disk at the very bottom, uh, which is kind of weird. Uh, but that actually gives me a chance to show you one last type of an installer um, before we move on. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah. Anyway, so sometimes I mean I guess that was a good I mean <laughs> blessing in disguise. Uh, because it's a full-fledged, you know, environment, so complete with UEFI, because you know uh, Eve is typically installed in the UEFI uh, enabled hardware, right? Uh, you can actually press escape, you know, if you're fast enough during the make run, whatever, you know, and that will get you to that, you know, blue screen that is very similar to what you would find in a BIOS on modern pieces of hardware. And if you feel like you're stuck, a lot of times that is because you know your boot order sort of is messed up. Uh, so I fixed it here and, you know, but it required the manual intervention because I basically was playing with it before this presentation. Uh, but other than that, you know, again, just to complete this uh, line of, uh, you know, explaining on the installer. So it is clearly now labeled as an installer. So you can basically tell that this is not a regular Eve image. It's actually an installer image. So let's actually try running it. Uh, if we run it, you know, this is the image that runs to completion in a sense that it basically will start producing this type of output saying that I'm you know, laying out the bits on the system, right? And once it's done laying out the bits on the system, uh, it will actually shut down this instance of QEMU, which is pretty convenient because you know, that will get me back to the command line prompt. And I know that my installer succeeded. Um, and this is pretty much it, right? So this is, this is how typically the end of it looks like. Uh, so now it will tell me that it will be powering the system off. Um, and that's about it. So it's powered off. Now, if I want to see whether the installer really was successful, I can actually run this special target called run target, uh, which is uh, testing that the uh, installer was successfully done installing and laying out all of the bits. Now, this is actually getting to be pretty esoteric. So, I mean, typically you wouldn't get to that level. The only other installer that I wanted to show you is the installer.net. Uh, because that allows you to produce, you know, bits that will be uh, useful in a pixie boot type of a situation. 
and let me actually show you how they look like. Um, so yeah, by the way, this is the ARM64, right? So we don't care. I mean, we will run the container here locally anyway, even though it's an ARM container, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, now speaking one final bit. So I showed you how to boot Eve, you know, off of the hard disk, right? You know, I can show you it's essentially the same for ISO images. But one last thing that we do is for every release of Eve, you know, obviously releases are tracked on the tags. So let's click on the latest one, 6.2.0. For every release of Eve, we're effectively publishing the artifacts that are required for netboot or pixie boot. And that's the, uh, you know, this installer.net, uh, installer-net, you know, target. Uh, and that is actually how we use Eve on um, packet.net or any other lab infrastructure that would require Pixie Boot. You can even, like I was showing you here, you know, run it locally. So run installer, you know, net will basically simulate a Pixie Boot environment. Uh, but let me actually show you how we're using it on packet. Um, So this is the Equinix Metal Console. For those of you not familiar, it's actually very, very nice uh, because it gives you ability to run on uh, bare metal servers, right? And, you know, we do quite a bit of it, as you can see. Uh, but the way you would deploy it is uh, you would basically pick like an instance. So let's actually pick something closer to me. Um, let's see, Sunnyvale or Silicon Valley, I think it's here. Yeah, right here. So I'm picking Sunnyvale data center because, you know, I'm in San Jose. Sunnyvale is the closest place for me, you know, in the data centers that Packet has. And in the Sunnyvale data center, Packet has this really useful small, you know, machine, uh, which costs pretty much nothing. You know, it's seven cents per hour. So if I want to deploy even it, I would basically select custom IPC. And here I would, paste the URL, you know, from the GitHub, right? That's it. That's all that's required to Pixie Boot Eve, right? You know, if I click deploy now, you know, the server will pull the bits from the publicly available URLs on GitHub. These are all of the release bits. Uh, and it's actually very nice. So it takes no time at all to boot on packet or any other, you know, Pixie Boot-like infrastructure. And that kind of concludes our tour of, you know, the basics of Eve. So I actually uh, left a lot of time for questions and answers. Don't know how much of it we have to use, uh, but I also didn't want it to be overwhelming. Uh, so even if we, you know, don't have to use it, I mean, that's fine, I think. Yeah, thanks, Roman. So, uh, uh, guys, uh, just to recap, right? We we showed uh, or overlay of where the source code is, where the APIs are, and how how to build, operate, and reboot and install end-to-end uh, -end packages uh, with the architecture which we uh, went through last week, uh, and then the how the realization of that architecture on final bits and bytes is happening is what today's presentation was. Uh, any questions, uh, uh, anything, Obi, uh, Maria, you want to, um, Marina, you want to ask? I guess, what's the support for, you just showed the uh, Pixie, yeah, what's, uh, how often is that? Is that something you guys are planning to standardize on or how, what's the plan? I mean, it's already standardized on. Uh, we use it all the time for testing, right? You know, that's this is how we do testing on Packet because that's the only way to use Packet. Uh, we use it a lot. I like I use it a lot in my lab uh, nowadays. You know, it's like my Raspberry Pi and my Jetson Nano also do you know do Pixie Boot. Uh, but most of the time, when it comes to actual deployment, I mean, Pixie environment is just not available. I mean, straight out, not a, straight up, not available. So, I mean, most of our customers, you guys included, uh, would still use you know something like uh, install to the hard drive. Uh, but if you're running a lab uh, and you're developing Eve yourself, I mean, Pixie Boot is super useful, yeah. And it could be also be something that you saw sort of at a manufacturing setup when you say, oh, I need to install or sort of staging things where you go and install Eve. Well, you can do it with the USB stick where you being a manufacturer or someone who does the, the staging of things. Or you can set up a Pixie environment where you do this stuff, right? And now that gives you an easier way of getting Eve on and, you know, onboarding these devices. And then you can go and deploy them where they need to be deployed. 
Yeah, so I meant as a, as a quick way to have people. So if, if I wanted to evaluate, let's say, if I, I did not, I don't have hardware, right? So I was looking at a, yeah. you know, a good mechanism to to quickly, you know, check it out. Yeah, they, in particular in combination with Packet, right? This is what Roman did was that he went and tried it on a bunch of different machines of different sizes and caliber, performance, whatever, in the Packet has. And you just spin it up and part of what you need to do, and there's actually a script that's you need to help to create a model because the controller needs to have some model of what the hardware is, what, what Ethernet interfaces and USB ports it has, right? So there's a script to go generate that. And now you can actually say, hey, I can try this on this big thing and does the GPU work, et cetera, right? And I don't have to go order the hardware to do that if it sits in packet somewhere. So it's quite powerful. So. Uh, the security model you have is based on sort of small grain, small grain uh, size of containers. Does this uh, go as well into NVIDIA graphics cards or things like that? Can you extend that model into uh, uh, processing hardware? Yeah, we're actually working with NVIDIA right now on Jetson, and the problem that we're solving for them is the following. So uh, Jetson requires really, I mean, by modern Bain standards, you know, old version of the Linux kernel, because that's the only version that NVIDIA is comfortable supporting their closed source proprietary drivers on. So what we're trying to do is just purely as a prototype, I mean, there is no customer for that, but it would be a nice, you know, developer project is essentially stick all of that, you know, drivers and, you know, NVIDIA own sort of old kernel in a, into its own domain. So that's what's in Zen, you know, land is known as driver domain. So that you can basically completely isolate all of the code that is in business of driving a piece of hardware into its own domain. And then, you know, the actual kernel that, you know, is powering up your system is uh, in, in a different domain. Uh, so once that is complete, that will be a first example of us sort of, you know, doing the driver domains, which is actually pretty powerful from both security, but also management of legacy type of drivers uh, type of situation. So again, I mean, like one bit that I hope I was able to successfully communicate today is that Eve is definitely built out of the same building blocks that a traditional Linux distribution would be built out of. But the way that those building blocks are put together is very different. It's, it's very sort of uh, novel, I would say. And it's much closer to, again, something like, you know, Linux kit and Docker desktop than, you know, an embedded Linux distro. And there are good reasons for that, right? You know, because we don't have to get stuck with, you know, old ways of building these types of software. But, but could we generalize if I, if, I piece, if I have a piece of hardware that uh, sort of natively supports a Linux kernel and where the Linux kernel is well, well established. So I have a good chance there as well to make Eve making to make it work, is this true? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. That is absolutely true, yes. Okay. All right, last call for questions. Actually, for me or for Eric, I mean, since he's also on the line and I kind of hogged the presentation today, but. <laughs> and one ask from my side is that now, as you guys are uh, getting into deep on the Eve side, please uh, be uh, open to join the Eve mailing list contributions and anything which is, uh, uh, as, a, as a, uh, you guys have deep experience in developing these kind of software. So uh, uh, anything uh, open source contributions, we highly welcome. Yeah, and the Slack channel as well, right? I mean, if you're asking questions about how Eve is built or how Eve functions, right? As opposed to, you know, um, commercial arrangements. But, but if it's about Eve itself, you, you know, I think it's very good for this sort of overall community if those questions are asked there because now other people will see the questions, right? And they can contribute answers or they can learn things and whatever the community can grow that way. So. Yeah, that actually reminds me. So I have a friend of mine who is a professor of computer science, and he's actually now looking at Eve to be used in his teaching course because he thinks that it's the easiest way to explain to students how to put, you know, a functional operating system together because, you know, every other industry accepted example is way too complicated. Uh, I mean, like there are toy operating systems, right? You know, like Minix or whatever, but, you know, uh, an operating system that would actually have customers and be put in production 
perspective is the easiest way to build an operating system. At least that's his opinion. <laughs> Okay, if nothing else, I think we have two minutes left. Any final questions? So, uh, just a question to join the Slack channel. Is there an invitation required or can we just- No, uh... no, 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 you, you just go to this URL. Actually, let me show it here. Um, LFedge slack.com, right? And you just sign up, like straight up, just sign up. All right. No invitation, no nothing. Thank you. Yeah, the other thing that we mentioned the other day is that we have these, you know, the, the, the EVE technical steering committee, they have sort of a more formal meeting to the extent that it's formal, but once a month and then other, other, you know, Thursdays, you know, three Thursdays out of four, it's actually a open office hour. So if people want to save on typing, you know, welcome to dial in there. And there's typically a couple of us there just, you know, sort of talking to ourselves or answering questions for people that, are exploring and learning things. So, so that's on Thursdays as well. You can find it on the, the wiki, but um, we actually had one a couple hours back.